This morning, I'm going to offer a few ways from my Buddhist tradition to meet the troubles of our world and our own lives with maybe a little more grace, a little more rest, even a little bit of humor. I hope that the music and reading and a fellowship afterwards, the words I offer, will truly fill your spirit today and for your week. Just yesterday evening, I arrived back in the Midwest by train from New Mexico after spending a beautiful snowy month at Ukiah Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is my life. <laughs> this week is the way my life is to practice both in the Zen Buddhist tradition and as a Unitarian Universalist. A few years ago, in December of 2018, pre-pandemic, after a year as the lead minister of the UU congregation in uh, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, I went to the same place, the Kaya Zen Center, to attend a seven-day silent Zen retreat, which is called a Sishin in Japanese. Despite decades of retreat practice and Buddhist practice, it had been five years since I had spent a week in silence. The five years that happened to coincide with my final years of seminary and my first few years in professional ministry. Every year, it had felt like the world was calling me to be of service, that the church I was serving needed me, and I would regretfully admit to myself, not this year. But that December, I felt that I finally could spend some sacred time to renew the wellsprings of my own life. I went deep into the silence, listening to the wind, looking up into that brilliant mountain night sky, hearing the soft rustle of falling snow, chanting in this beautiful meditation hall held up by giant tree trunks, uh, chanting sutras with the 80 or so people who were gathered then all together for that seven days, much as I have been doing with a smaller group now that COVID is here uh, over the last month. And the very next day, at the end of that Zen Sishin, I flew to San Diego to participate in a clergy witness and civil disobedience in response to the horrors that were happening, and frankly, are still happening, on our southern border. Along with nearly 500 other people of faith, Unitarian Universalists, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, all walking uh, down the beach towards the massive wall that actually goes into the ocean for a long way past that beach. Now some people might say, how can you go from a silent retreat to being face to face with armed border patrol agents? And I say, how can I not go from a silent retreat to being face to face with the Border Patrol. For me, this is what it is to be Unitarian Universalist and a Zen priest. <coughs> and you might wonder, which is the real spiritual practice? The time sitting on the black cushion in the silent meditation hall, or the time on the border. <laughs> People tend to think that spiritual practices and engagement with the world are at opposite ends of a spectrum. People also tend to think 
that Buddhism in particular is all about sitting quietly and withdrawing from the world, letting go of our passionate care for this world, for some kind of inner development. This has not been my experience, hasn't been my life experience at all. My experience over nearly 40 years of Buddhist practice is that it is precisely those practices and teachings <coughs> that have made it possible for me to continue to be engaged in the heartbreaking and never-ending work of activism and work for justice without <coughs> turning away, without descending into cynicism or rage or apathy, although those feelings arise now and again in doing that work. I want to thank Arthur for bringing up uh, this anniversary, which I've seen the, the plaque that people worked hard to put up in Fairbanks Park, but I didn't realize that today was the day. That's what I'm talking about in terms of the never-ending work. Always, always it seems we are faced with horrors and with tragedy. Since the beginning of this year, 2023 alone, in this country we have had the nightmare murders, let's call them what they are, lynchings of Tyree Nichols and Keenan Anderson. At the hands of the very people who are pledged to the protection of all citizens. We have had more mass shootings than days since the beginning of this year. And just this week, at the one year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine, <coughs> there are estimates that in this time, in this year, there have been as many as 200,000 deaths of Russian soldiers, many of them very young men, 100,000 deaths of Ukrainian soldiers, and possibly as many as 100,000 civilians killed. No one really knows the real numbers. These numbers and this degree of suffering is nearly inconceivable and it is so easy to just want to turn away. What I have found is that I want my heart to be open to these realities so that I can respond. I want to be the person who, re who weeps when she reads the newspaper because there are things worth weeping over. And I hope, this is my life's work, to be a little bit like the person in the boat from the reading we heard earlier. The person who's calm can help everyone to be more likely to survive. We can all work to be that person, to be the person who's calm helps our families to make it from one day to the next, our communities to make it from one day to the next. The more deeply you look within on those little black cushions in the meditation hall, the more it is clear that we are all connected, just like our seventh principle. And that our salvation, in every sense of that word, is bound up with each other. As Gandhi said, this is a fantastic quote, those who say spirituality has nothing to do with politics do not know what spirituality really means. Many, many centuries ago in China, a student asked his teacher, what is Zen? And the teacher said, an appropriate response what is the appropriate response right now in this world? I can't tell you what your appropriate response is. 
That's for you to find out. But I don't think it's turning away, nor do I think it is drowning in fear or anger. I think at times like this, spiritual practices are essential so that we can wake up to what is happening and engage. This won't be a surprise to you that many of us are moving so fast and so frantically, either in an attempt to survive economically or to address the wrongs around us. I know some of you in this room are very involved with that. That spiritual practices become a necessary afterthought, like my five years after I went into ministry. I don't really believe in giving advice, because who actually follows advice? <laughs> but I'm going to break my own rule this morning, since these are desperate times, and offer a little advice. Four easy spiritual practices for resilience and renewal, which you are free to ignore. I'm really reminding myself as much as you. First, find ways to slow down and feed your spirit. Maybe some of you feel like you're running a marathon. But in a marathon, and I've never run a marathon, so I've only heard this, you need to be sure to get enough water and to pace yourself. And I'm half convinced that there are some people out there who are trying to get us to never rest, Never stop surfing the internet so that we won't stop and think about what is happening. I invite you to consider rest a radical act. <laughs> As the black activist and founder of Nap Ministry, which is a real thing, and author of Rest as Resistance, the Nap Bishop Patricia Percy reminds us, rest as a radical act. It's said that Gandhi used to meditate for an hour a day with his followers, but one day there was a big political action, and everybody said, today is so busy that we won't be meditating, right? And he said, today is so busy, we will be meditating for two hours. <laughs> I think it might have been before the salt march. <clears throat> Maybe you're saying to yourself right now, I can't meditate. That's just not my thing. I am certainly not going to be meditating for two hours. I am here to tell you there is such a thing as homeopathic amounts of meditation and that they can make a difference. Even a moment of presence goes a very, very long way. Years ago, I was asked to help with a, a small group that was forming of mothers of young children. And I was the token non-mother of a young children. And these women, only one of them had ever been involved with doing meditation practice. And all they did once a week was come together and sit in silence for half an hour, and then for a half an hour they would share about the stresses and difficulties, any of you who have young children might remember this, of their lives. And I had thought before this that really, for real transformation <coughs> to happen in a life, it did need to happen on retreat or in a monastery. But over the years, I saw how these women's lives changed. I don't think any of them were able to meditate more than that time that they gathered together every week. But they became more like that person on the boat. They became people with more capacity, less reactivity, more compassion for themselves, for the people in their lives, for their children. It was really beautiful to see. So, to summarize my first piece of advice, find a way to slow down and be present with your life. Whether you call it meditation, or a walk in the woods, or drinking a cup of tea while looking out the window, your adrenal glands will thank you 
if no one else. But probably others will notice too. Number two piece of advice. This is so simple, but I have to say it. Practice gratitude. The harder and uglier things get, the more important this practice is. And yes, we have a right to some happiness, even when things are falling apart, whether personally or societally. And there are thousands of ways to practice gratitude. You can keep a gratitude journal. You can spend just a couple of minutes before going to sleep considering things that happened that day for which you're grateful. I know people who have this beautiful practice that over their evening meal, each person goes around the table and says something they're grateful for. Like most practices, it doesn't need to be elaborate. You don't need to go spend a lot of money somewhere to do a gratitude practice. And there is strong scientific evidence that developing something as simple as this can increase happiness, personal happiness, tremendously. So do it for yourself, even if it's for no one else. Advice number three, and this may seem strange to a bunch of Unitarian Universalists, but that's why I'm offering it to you. It is at the heart, really, of Zen practice, and incredibly helpful in tough times. Practice not knowing. We are so sure we know. Our thoughts about the world and about what's going on can literally drive us crazy. But they are just thoughts. And when we realize this, we can act with greater inner peace. Thich Nhat Hanh, the uh, author of that reading you heard, used to tell his students to ask themselves over and over, are you sure? Am I sure? Am I really sure of this opinion? Am I really sure of this thought about another human being or about what is happening? For instance, perhaps like some of you, I am sometimes filled with dread about our collective future. But the reality is, I don't know what that future will bring. And no one does. Not even the wisest pundit, not even the brightest climate change scientist, none of us know for sure. I can ask myself, are you sure? And rest in my strong commitments to the future, to acting for what I believe in, without knowing the outcome. Okay, now I'm getting to the simplest piece of advice I have. Number four, pay attention to your feet. <laughs> Pay attention to them right now. See how they are beneath you, in contact with the floor, connected to the earth beneath the floor? We spend so much time up here in our heads. Meanwhile, our humble feet are supporting us all the time, quietly. To feel your feet is to feel your foundation. <clears throat> to quite literally ground yourself. Whether you are standing in a grocery line, having an argument with your spouse or partner, sure that doesn't happen here, <laughs> or facing a line of oncoming police at a direct action, feeling your feet will bring you into your body and in contact with the earth, which is always there supporting you, and which receives all of us at the end. And on a lighter note, a little bonus advice from the great Hoosier satirist Kurt Vonnegut. His last words of advice to an audience in 2007, before he passed away. 
And how should we behave during the apocalypse? We should be unusually kind to one another, certainly. But we should also stop being so serious. Jokes help a lot. And get a dog. <laughs> if you don't already have one. Who was it? Who, who, yeah, who's, yeah, who's, whose daughter was going to be getting a dog? I don't know. So, pause. Not P A W S. Pause. P A U S E. Remember gratitude. Practice not knowing. Feel your feet. Don't forget to laugh now and again. And if you want, Get a dog. Yeah. I'd like to close with these really beautiful words written by the Buddhist teacher Jack Kornfield in those very difficult days after the 2016 election. Sure we all remember those days. Speaking of dread, this is what he wrote You are not alone. You have generations of ancestors at your back. You have the blessings of interdependence and community. You have the great trees of the forest as steadfast allies. You have the turning of the seasons and the renewal of life as your music. You have the vast sky of emptiness to hold all things graciously. Now it is time to step forward, bringing your equanimity and courage, wisdom, 